their perceptions influence that conservation. And um, since this wasn't a research project, I kind of wanted to have something to show for it so, um, so that more people could understand what I was learning about bats. So I ended up just trying to make a short video. I was just recording on my iPhone, uh, terrible audio quality. And at the end of the year, I tried to stitch it together into a documentary. So this is the first documentary I've made and I call it The Truth About Bats. And um, I think it's good timing that it came out because bats are getting a lot of criticism right now because of the COVID outbreak, which they suspect it could have come from a bat, but it's not confirmed yet. So um, it's actually causing a lot of people to go out and kill bats, unfortunately. So um, I'm hoping this documentary can help people realize the importance of bats and, um, and yeah, and understand why people fear them so much. So with that, we can view the documentary. Uh, Margo, are you going to play it or shall I try to play it from YouTube? Um, you, you go ahead. Okay, hopefully it's loaded. Oh, I have to screen share, don't I? Share screen. Okay. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so we'll play it here. Can you hear? Bat populations are in yeah. serious decline in almost every place where they've been investigated. The most serious threat to bats is failure to understand them. Watch that. Few of them. Few of them. Few of them are not really good animals. Bats are of huge economic importance throughout much of the world. Bats actually do a lot for the environment, for the human race. They eat a lot of insects. They eat a lot of the pest insects. Bats at Congress Avenue Bridge, about a million and a half bats during the summer. They're eating about 10 tons of insects every night, and that makes an enormous difference to the number of pest insects that are on the landscape that costs agriculture billions of dollars every year, both in crop loss and in the pesticides. It's been conservatively calculated that bats are saving American farmers almost $23 billion a summer. And you got to keep track of the fact that this is at very reduced numbers, not what they could do if we had full populations of that. Worldwide, there's a large number of economically important plants that depend on bats for pollination or seed dispersal. Just the tequila and mezcal production from agave plants that rely on bats for pollination is worth billions annually. Africa has the baobab tree. It's of great ecological importance to Southeast Asia, bananas without preserving those bats that they require for pollination, we could threaten one of the world's most important food crops. In Southeast Asia, there's probably no fruit more cherished than durian. Again, it sells for billions of dollars annually. And yet you can't produce a durian fruit even in an orchard without bats to pollinate the flowers. Many of the most valued timber trees of Australia are dispersed or pollinated by bats. They're incredibly important pollinators as well as them being really important seed dispersers. Clearly, go around the world, name your place, and there's something of big importance that we might lose with the bats. But as important as bats are to our lives, we're losing them rapidly. And the main threat is us. Main threats to bats all across the world really start with the habitat destruction. Because of deforestation, some of them are gone. There's other threats as well. I mean, they, the bats get persecuted by people. But the main one, yeah, is deforestation and, and persecution by people. People don't know about them, so they're a little bit ready to fear them. And Western negative perceptions about bats, it's in our old stories and all that superstitions, all that sort of thing. Although I don't think a lot of people really take a lot of notice of that, but it's in our subconscious. The majority of the nocturnal animals that they know very little about, they make myths. They actually think that they are evil and it's a bad omen. 
they are evil animals which push play that people in our grandparents used to say like best come in a house they will catch your nose so we are fed lots from that <laughs> we strongly consider it as a vampire it's a blood sucker they say like blood <laughs> <laughs> Out of roughly 1,400 species of bats, only three of the species are vampire bats, and they're only found in Latin America. A lot of the myths are actually originated from the West. We don't have vampire bats in India, but still people will think of that. It's basically from either some movie or something that they've seen. Sometimes my family gets scared of <laughs> vampires. But why do people's perceptions of bats matter? So, uh, Ted Fleming and I went to uh, Northwest Mexico to study the endangered Leptonycteris bats, pollinating cacti. We found that the people had burned their local roots. When asked why, they said, oh, if a bat flies over you at night and urinates in your eye, you'll go blind. I really believed that. And this led to burning several key roots. Having this underlying fear makes it hard for people to tolerate living with bats. They stink. Smell? They stink. They smell bad. The smell of the bat. The dirtiest creature on there makes the whole thing stinking. We get some smell. You know, guano can be smelly. Bats can be loud. Yeah. Anything that infuses on what in your home should be just you. <laughs> envisaged nectar. Tolerance of people has gone down and this had a effect on bats that used to earlier live with people but not anymore. So if you find bats in your house, what do people do? Normally we kill them. And straight away, no two ways about it. My parents used to say, if we see it, we could kill it. If that bat is in your house, something bad is going to happen. If you find a bat in the house and something bad will happen to them, maybe they believe that someone will die in their family. There are some superstitions that some people use them for witchcraft activities. The fetuses of the bats can be used to blind someone to your intentions. They might even slap you when they're flying. They can slap people. They can slap you. People believe that it's. Ah, yeah, they slap people, they are witches. They do hit people. Just hit. Usually, there is an issue with witchcraft and also magic. So, whenever uh, people get to hear about that, in the West, many people decide to kill bats because they're afraid of getting rabies. But getting rabies from bats is incredibly rare. It's the rarest disease in America. It only kills one to two people a year. We have a serious problem because of gross exaggeration of fear about bats. People will not protect what they fear. So what are some ways that we can try to change people's opinions about bats? Try and focus on education because people don't care about laws. Can I get education from the public? Usually by the time you've spoken to someone and you've explained it to them, people calm down and they understand. They don't know the good sides of bats and how they're useful to us. Hopefully the education normalises, you know, working out what ways you can do to live with the flying foxes. Education is by far the most effective approach and now I'll give you a very good example. You go to this Tennessee cave owner Ask him for permission to study bats in his cave. And he says, oh, he'd be delighted to have me study his bats. But while I'm there, kill all I can. He thought studying bats meant killing them, that, <laughs> that you had to kill them and take them away. Right. And if I had bristled and told him the bats were valuable and gotten after him, I might have not even gotten permission to go on his property. Mm -hmm but I just thanked him for permission to go and study his bats. Went in the cave and I noticed that out in front he was growing uh, potatoes. And uh, when I went in the cave, I noticed potato beetle wings scattered all over the floor where bats had brought them in, eating them and dropped the elytra on the floor. So I picked up a handful of those. When I came out, I pretended a little bit of ignorance and said, you know, I'm, uh, 
trying to understand a bit better what these beds eat, uh, I found these under the roost. Do you know what these are? Oh, them blankety blank potato bugs. <laughs> them suckers eat potato bugs. I said, yeah, but that's not all they eat. You know, they're probably eating corn earworm moths also, and maybe even a few mosquitoes. Well, how many insects do they eat in a night? Well, Colony that size probably eats 100 pounds of insects in a night. Oh, that's a lot of insects. I come back a month later, and I haven't said one thing about protecting his bats. Never told him he should protect them. And he became a staunch bat conservationist without ever even having the word conservation mentioned. That's effective conservation. And so education is pretty powerful. Education is incredibly powerful. I mean, at the same time that we saved a million and a half bats here in Austin, we lost a colony of almost the same size in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. And the only difference was that here somebody knew their value and cared enough to communicate it with the effective. Was the, the classic education, like actually vaccine mosquitoes, all these things you can do, but they only ever reach as far as we can reach. It's pretty remote for most people to say they're really important pollinators and seed dispersers. Unless people have a connection with an animal, it's very hard for them to value it and want to protect it. It doesn't look like a, a, a dots. The bats don't have much time to wait for our opinions to change. Bats are being electrocuted on power lines, caught on barbed wire, sliced in wind turbines, starved by deforestation, disturbed by light pollution, paralyzed by ticks, fried in heat waves, Car. and decimated by the white nose syndrome. All of this, in addition to bats being disturbed, hunted, and persecuted by people. Entire colonies are collapsing. We're losing bats by the millions, and many species are becoming endangered and are facing extinction. But even so, there is still hope. People are generally far more aware that bats have value. That doesn't mean that we don't still have very big problems. There's still a lot more we need to do. We can and should take pride in what we've accomplished thus far. It should encourage us to have hope for the future. If so few of us can do so much in such a short period of time with so few resources, there must be some hope. Could everyone? Could everyone? It did quite well coming from the UK. <laughs> so, if anyone has any questions about any of the topics in the video or how I made the video or anything like that, I'm very happy to talk, chat about it. Come on, guys. Oh, very well done. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent work. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> We've actually got a couple of friends that have gotten the Watson and uh, okay. 
and we've been doing bat conservation for years uh, and it's all about education and yeah, you're exactly right <laughs> yeah yeah you can really see people's expressions just change so much once they learn just a few facts about them or if they see them up close especially we have a festival we do every year or we go to every year and set up and we've we've seen over uh, I don't know, years now uh, kids grow up and they always come back to the same place they always come back and see us uh, they tell us what they learned about bats throughout the last year and it's it's pretty exciting really yeah. we, we borrowed the back of the cave from uh, nature conservancy and set that up it's it's a pretty neat setup, but oh, yeah, that's awesome. our friends. <laughs> that's great work. Other questions? So in, in the yeah. video, you mentioned uh, the white nose syndrome. I was camping up at uh, Devil's Den State Park oh, a couple of years ago up in northwest Arkansas, and uh, they had the uh, the caves blocked off. So people couldn't get in there because of the white nose syndrome. I'm, I, I haven't heard anything about that lately. Uh, does anybody know, anybody know what the status is of the white nose syndrome or the bats here, here in Arkansas? Um, right now, it's kind of its stasis. It's it, it moves through, uh, leaves its indelible footprint, and then just keeps on moving. I don't know how how far into Texas they've uh, if they've if they found that, that's kind of the fear is getting into these big hibernaculums. Uh, the cave that we manage uh, had a had a round of white nose syndrome uh, several years ago. And we, we were fortunate enough to have people from Arkansas Game and Fish, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, uh, Nature Conservancy, all there for a bio inventory. So uh, we could, we could you know, present all the, what was there to the landowner. And uh, it, it just so happened to coincide perfectly. And we got to the bottom of the pipe and there were hundreds, hundreds of, of dead and dying bats. And that really, they, they kicked us even more into the, the conservation end of things because it, when it's up close and personal and it's, uh, it, it was pretty devastating. So it, we wound up taking buckets of bats out of the, and uh, about five different species. Yeah. Um, they, there had been some blasting and some mines across the, the White River, and uh, it was at the end of January, so it was not a good time to really wake up the hibernaculum. Uh, and they were already infected, and uh, the first big cave that they came to was the managed. And that's where they all went, and so we, we got a, a first-hand uh, learning experience. It was really, really bad. So it's, right now, we don't we don't see quite another. We don't really have any bats left in that cave either. We, yeah. we had tricolors uh, there, and the highest count we had was maybe 28. But after these bats exited their cave and wound up in our cave, um, there, were, there were hundreds, hundreds of bats. And, um, so it was just, they thought maybe a safe haven, I guess. But it, it, it's devastating. And we, we don't see nearly, I mean, we've one or two bat times in our cave now. But we've got a good, healthy population of uh, red bats at the top. So that's <laughs> yes, on the outside, we're, our population is doing better now than in the cave. Um, the, there's still the federal moratorium in place on, um, on federally owned caves, no entry into any of those. It was set to expire, but I don't know if they've done a formal extension, but they haven't lifted it. Even though it was set to already expire, they've continued with that. And my guess is they, they won't lift it. Um, I know just in the past few weeks, white nose has now been discovered in the Dakotas for the first time and confirmed there. So it's still spreading across the U.S. And still, you know, in some areas though, the, the populations are rebounding, maybe not to their full, you know, back where they were, but they're in some areas, they're actually coming back stronger than they had anticipated that they would. And some of those bats seem to be managing to deal with it and stay alive. So, so there's some good points and, you know, hopeful <laughs> spots in there, but not really in, in Arkansas. It's just, there's been a major hit. So I, my guess is they won't lift 
the moratorium on the federally managed caves. So Devil's Den, we may never get to see inside those caves again. I don't know. <laughs> it's been years since we got to go there and, and that was our daughter's first cave when she was four years old. So we, we you know, and, and his first cave when he was a very small child. So, you know. <laughs> it was a long time ago. It was a long time ago. I have a question for you. Um, I was going to ask you, have you seen uh, a change in attitudes, especially amongst the academic, about bats with COVID-19? Kind of the rumor is it's coming from bats. Yeah, it's, it's a complicated topic, definitely. Um, yeah, the, so, so the a similar virus was found in bats called um, SARS-CoV-2. And so, and that was found in a horseshoe bat some years ago. So that's why researchers think that COVID could have come in, come from a bat, but it hasn't been confirmed. And also, probably had an intermediary host species, so maybe like maybe from a bat to a pangolin, then to a human. So even though you, even, even though it's not confirmed that it, that it has come from a bat, um, you also we also can't catch it from bats because it's only being transmitted from human to human. But the the problem is even though bats don't don't pose a threat to us people will interpret that as bats are carriers of disease and then try to go out and kill them or move them out of the, the area and actually that makes the problem worse because there's a lot of scientific papers um, showing that culling animals actually increases the risk of disease rather than reducing it um, so yeah it has been um, kind of a tough myth to, myth to dispel because once that, that fear sinks in it's is hard for facts like oh they're important for pollinating which is more like, you know, a bit less tangible to you in your, your, your life. So it's, it's hard to combat the fear, but yeah, I, I think it's important to, to definitely try. And when they put that out, we were like, oh, come on. <laughs> no. I mean, yeah, let's confirm that before we really scare everybody. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But good work. Where all have you been? Uh, for, th for that year, I traveled to nine countries. So it's Fiji, Australia. Papua New Guinea, which is incredible, yeah, Thailand, Cambodia, India, Nepal, Malawi, and Madagascar. Awesome. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, awesome. It's, it's great because I got to live like right in the villages with different bat hunters and bat rehabbers. And I went on bat hunting expeditions and, and really got to hear some crazy myths from people. Um, some people believe that bat wings can be used to cure menstrual pains some <laughs> or that um yeah the bats peeing in your eye cause blindness in india they believe that bats will come and catch your nose or stick on your ears um or, or but the the myth that bats are vampires is pretty much everywhere thanks to movies i think so it's very interesting learning how all these different cultures kind of view them yeah well, at least the the flying foxes and the fruit bats are kind of they're 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 really good ambassadors because yeah. they're so dang cute and uh, when they're babies i mean they look like little flying puppies and yeah. so if, if, if you can introduce them with that and not show them a leaf nose right off the bat because those things are like oh my god or a ghost face bat <laughs> right. google those if you haven't before <laughs> their eyes are basically in their ears <laughs> they're like, insane looking even the horseshoe bats are like that's an odd looking critter, you know. Yeah, exactly. They're cute in their own way. So. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I have to admit it, it's very impressive being in Austin and seeing at the uh the bridge the, the bats taking off. It is impressive. Yeah. Yeah, it's turned into a huge tourist attraction there. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hopefully those folks all leave with a different view after, you know, when they go home after yeah. seeing that. And they, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. You know, I have a question. Uh, if, if, are there one or two things, actionable things, that uh, you think we could do coming out of this that would be helpful? Yeah, if you could share my documentary on your different Facebooks or platforms, that would be awesome to try to help. My list. Um, yeah, awesome. Um, and other than that, if you just see any articles linking bats and COVID, just maybe leaving a comment saying, oh, it's not confirmed. There's something to fear about them. Um, yeah, just really trying to dispel the myths. And or just posting pictures of like the cute baby flying foxes is also a really good way to change people's attitudes, I think. Way to so, work into it, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I will say when we do our, uh, we set up our booth at different uh, 
activities. We have four uh, bats, I don't know what to call them. They're, they're, they're very lifelike uh, rubber and they're, they're pretty good size. So we hang them around the, the display. And kids get really interested because they move with the wind, of course. Right. So that gives us a chance to at least say something. <laughs> we do try. That's funny there. Great. Yeah, the, the last year we did the festival, we had, uh, apparently it, it became popular in some of the schools and uh, at some of the elementary schools. So we had, we had, I don't, a lot of, of kids <laughs> come up and tell us, I mean, they were super excited to tell us what all they had learned about bats. And it's like, oh, well, here's some more information. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, I've done two schools this year. <laughs> so, yeah. about a little that, more than just bats, but a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, bat houses help? Hmm? What? If you put up bat houses, you know, does that help? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Actually, if, if, if you can get them in there, it's uh, sometimes it's a little tricky, and you've got to entice them a little bit and, and give, them, give them time. Yeah, patience. <laughs> time, patience, and making sure that it doesn't fill up with lost nests first. Um, mm. But yeah, it's, I mean, any, any way you can in, give them a place. Uh, it, it also helps on your property, you know, if you're, uh, you want to keep the mosquitoes down. Uh, and they, you know, typically they say put one up within, uh, a, a fairly close to a body of water because they, they you know, they're still going to need to drink. And the, uh, you know, even a, a big bird bath or something like that will work. Uh, and a lot of times, mosquito larvae also grow in those. So, you know, it, it's producing food for them, I guess. But, uh, <laughs> but it gives people something to kind of tend to and gives them some, I, I don't want to say ownership, but, you know, it, it gives them something. They, they feel like they've done something and they're involved and they've got an attachment to it and they'll tell other people and it's, uh, and you know, they're great for, for conversation. What the heck's that big thing on the side of the, you know, <laughs> We haven't given up on these up or building, building cabinets. <laughs> We're still going to try to do that if we find a place where we can put them. I'm actually hoping that maybe cabin settlement would be a place. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. 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 Would uh, it would be good. That's yeah. a good spot. You mentioned enticement. What, what kind of enticements do you provide for bats? Well, you, you margaritas. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the same for me. Mosquitoes. <laughs> Having a water feature. Water feature. Yeah. Um, and have a, there's there have been different things out that say um, to get them to move into your bat houses a little sooner that um, putting a little ammonia in there so that you already get a smell that's maybe not so pleasant to us but is more familiar for them for a roosting area um, some things like that that will help them to, to come in and and establish there um, but a water feature seems to be a really major that's a, a very important aspect of it I know there are folks that have put them up and they don't have, there's no water anywhere near, you know, or for some distance. And there tends to be more trouble getting them into their areas, so, or to establish there. I'm sure they're hunting there, but probably to roost there, you know. There's also some on uh, Bat Conservation International has some documents available on their website that give you some more ideas and things within different ranges and regions that are helpful for attracting them. Yeah, I've just attached a link in the group chat to that. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I can send out a handout that we have that lists a lot of, uh, you know, the different resources yeah. for, for bats. You know, the, the, the color of the, the bat house even it comes into play, not so much for the bats to, to visually, but uh, for, for heat, because they do like it warm when they're awake and they're, they're not hibernating. So it's, uh, you know, darker colors in this area, but not too dark. You don't want to cook them and it's... <laughs> yeah, it's, you can your fingers and hope some bats show up. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of that too. <laughs> we'll hear more. Okay. Okay. Um, now, uh, Tam, uh, Tam, Tammy <laughs> and Doug uh, said they would put something together to let us uh, get a glimpse of the cave, particularly for those of you who haven't seen it yet. So why don't we move to that? Emily, please stay with us if you like.
Yes, I'd love to. Thanks. All right. So uh, you all should be able to share your screen. I've got it set where anybody can. So I'm going to turn it over to Tammy and Doug Vanneman of the Green Bat. <laughs> all right. Let's see. Hold on just a second, okay? Uh, Becky, can you? Yes. Honey, you need to turn off your um, uh, sound. Oh. We can hear you walking. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's all right. I <laughs> thought I had. Okay, give it another shot. <laughs> all right, please go ahead. <laughs> So we're just going to talk a little bit about some very basic um, features of Arkansas caves and caves in the area and then as well as talk a little bit about Ennis Cave, the cave that we manage in north central Arkansas that I think most of you have been there. Um, got some photos in the background so you'll get some good views. The, the beginning um, slide here um, is a shot taken by some cave photographers that come down and visit us once or twice a year from Missouri. They're um, some guys that are all in their 70s and they have all been cavers since they were, some of them since they were children and others since they were teens. So when you talk about experienced cavers, these guys have got it under their belt and they have been doing cave photography most of that time. So they do some incredible stuff. Cave photography is a tricky thing to figure out. And um, so they've done things all the way, they, with bulbs and changing out and all kinds of craziness. But this is one of the shots that they did in um, the pa main passage. It's kind of a junction. There's a feature called the toadstool. Um, so, yeah. On the left of the screen, you can barely see I'm sitting on the edge over there for scale. So um, this is kind of one of those passive areas that most people, you just kind of walk through and junction to go into other areas. So you don't really necessarily pay that much attention to there are no particular, um, anything that's usually of much interest to folks. So it was kind of neat with all of their equipment that they could light it up so well and you can get to see the different colors and the, just the whole thing. So, so that's just kind of where we started. And when, so the other photos after that may not be as good because they were not taken by these guys. And that, that's one of the things about cave photography is, you know, there's so much particulate matter in the air. And also, you know, when we're breathing and we, we, we worked up a little bit of a sweat and steam's coming off your head and uh, then you breathe and you can see that all this stuff shows up in photos. And when you have just a, a regular camera with a flash attached to it, um, you know, that flash comes from the point that you're looking at and it tends to light up every little bit of dust or, or whatever's in the air and it comes out crystal clear, but the rest of the things are um, sometimes leave a little to be desired. So. Side lighting is the big deal. If you, if you light it from the sides, you don't, you don't get that. Yeah. So. <laughs> So a few of the basic terms um, when we talk about caves are karst and ca cave, of course, and dissolution. Um, we talk about karst. Yeah, it's just, and it's, it's worded well, a landscape underlain uh, by limestone. Uh, you know, there are certain areas in, in north central and uh, in northwest Arkansas that, that have a lot of, a lot of caves around. North Central actually has a lot bigger caves than you'll find in, in Northwestern. Uh, they tend to be a little smaller over there, a little less uh, 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 limestone, maybe a little more dolomite. But uh, the, the thing, you know, the limestone is basic by nature. It, it, it is uh, alkali, um, it has a, a, a higher pH. So you, you, you've got that rock sitting there. You can take, um, you can take vinegar and if you want to test something to see if it's limestone, you can actually drip vinegar onto limestone and watch it bubble and fizz. And uh, so that's this an acid-base reaction because you know the, the uh, 
you know, the vinegar is a, a weak acid. So what happens is, uh, you know, the old acid rain thing, we're picking up carbon dioxide in the air as the water comes down. And uh, there's also a lot of carbon rich stuff in the detritus on the, on the surface of the ground. So as uh, that organic matter has water run through it, it also picks up more carbon. So it, the, the acidity uh, increases and uh, it gets into these little cracks and fractures, um, tiny fissures and, and whatnot in there. And it just works over time. Uh, to dissolve away little bits and pieces. And uh, the other end of, of dissolving that is, is the, the deposition of, of those minerals. So as that dissolves, uh, most of your uh, limestone is, you know, is calcium carbonate. So once that runs off somewhere else and that water begins to evaporate or it sits still for a while, those minerals will settle out. And that's where we come up with splenothems or formations. Formations are actually rock, but everybody calls them formations, so we call them formations as well. But uh, and there's 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 a multitude of different types, um, and it, it depends on you know airflow. It depends on is it is it in the water where this happens, or is it a drip? Is it the drip from the ceiling that becomes a stalactite, and eventually below it a stalagmite starts, and at some point they meet and it becomes a column. Uh, there's these cool things called rimstone dams uh, as, as pools of water start to, uh, basically the minerals go to the outside edge of the pool of water and it builds up and it, it makes these neat little, uh, uh, yeah, little dams <laughs> and so with water in them and they tend to, to go either uphill or downhill and uh, the old timers called them fish ladders because they said a fish could get in there and they could jump from one to the other and actually go up and that's really not feasible, but <laughs> it's a neat idea. Uh, you know, you get into to, to curtains, the, the large sheets of calcium carbonate that come down. Uh, some of it is, is thin and you can see light through it and it'll have really light spots and really dark spots and we call that cave bacon. It looks just like big giant pieces of bacon on the, uh, hanging down. So. And then you get into the little helictites, and I think we've got some, maybe some photos of those in here. And those things are crazy. They have no real uh, direction. They, they just do what they want. They grow in weird directions. And recently we've seen something that there may actually be a biological reason for that. Uh, and there, there may be some, uh, some type of, uh, um, they're not exactly sure if it's a bacteria or what, but it, it's something that, that, that they feel like is, is controlling the, uh, uh, the path that they take because it, it's it's the circuitous route. It may be a curly Q or a circle or a question mark or whatever. So, but so so, so other terminology uh, cave. So obviously the cars to the dissolution, all that that kind of explains. I mean, it's a big underground. It's a hole in the ground. You know, a, a big chamber. Um, Usually when you refer to a cave, it's something that naturally occurred. Um, but also cave, and something we appreciate is that cave being used as a verb to go caving. <laughs> so um, we often get corrected or people will say, you know, you're spelunking and we say, no, we're caving. So when we get to the end, we'll kind of talk about that and how in the caving community, that's more of a fun term and um, and how we use that amongst amongst our group of folks <laughs> let's see so just a little more about dissolution and how the just what Doug said about the rainwater picking up the carbon dioxide um, Arkansas being home to limestone and sandstone caves most of the sandstone caves will be in, in the, the lower areas of the state. There's, there's actually, there's quite a few uh, sandstone caves with a lot of quartz in them uh, around hot springs. Now those caves, they, they only may be 20 feet deep, uh, 10 feet deep, or it may just be a big crack. But it's, uh, so you don't see these, these massive long cavern systems uh, with, with, with sandstone. And really the, the Outside of lava tubes, that's about, the, uh, limestone is about the only place where you really find these big cavern systems. Um, it's, and yeah, like 
we were talking about earlier, the Devil's Den State Park. It, it's got a lot of giant slots and crevices uh, where that have been eroded out, and they, they provide great cover for the bats. And it's a, it's an interesting place. You can be in a cave and not feel completely confined because um, there's there's always an opening. I snuck off and went back in the cave when I was a very small child. So I was the first cave rescue up there. They said it was rescue. I was fine. I was I was just hanging out, but everybody else was freaked out. Uh, um, some of the limestone caves in Arkansas, so the, the longest right now um, is documented. They have documented mapped um, about nine miles of cave, and that's considered the longest documented cave in Arkansas. Um, it's on federal land. It's closed. It's very tight. Yeah, you can't get in there. Um, the, but then Ennis is actually in the top 10 on the longest caves in Arkansas, documented caves in Arkansas. So right now we have around four miles of caves that are documented or mapped. Um, mapping caves is another, there's a whole group of people that, 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 that do that. <laughs> um, but we also, as far as Ennis goes, there, there is more cave than that. There are areas of the cave that we are aware of that, um, we visit that have not actually been added to the map. So we know there's more than that. We also know that there are some areas, or we are, we feel pretty certain that there are some areas of the cave that um, are blocked from debris, from uh, breakdown from years ago, from a cave in, probably caused from the blasting when they were mining the area um, that from the locals, from tales from the locals, that's where the actual big part of the cave is. So in our minds, we've only hit the, just tipped the uh, surface there that there's way more to explore. It's just a matter of gaining access to that. So, but it's, it's pretty cool that we get to manage and take people to visit one of the longest caves in Arkansas. <laughs> and this is it. Ennis Cave is uh, it's 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 actually it's located in Stone County, outside of uh, Mountain View, in between Mountain View and Batesville, actually. And uh, you know when we're given the, the directions, there's always the uh, there's there's a historic marker up there, and uh, that's where the Confederate flag is. And it's a uh, <laughs> it's like turn at the Confederate flag, and people go, Ooh. but um, it, it's it's. The cave itself was purchased back in the 30s uh, by a mining company, and uh, they were they mined for manganese to use in uh, metallurgy, and uh, they did that for several years, and they they hit the big giant pockets that were close to the uh, close to the entrance, and they have, they they cleaned most of that out. Um, they shut down operations about the just prior to World War II, and uh, they they revisited multiple times over the years to go back and, and, and do an analysis to see if it was worth it to take it out and, they, and it never was, which is good uh, for us because they, there was a lot of damage done uh, by, by the blasting in there. Um, you know, that, that's like, there's a, there's a giant hole over the top of the uh, entrance um, and it was where they set up basically uh, like a tripod to, to take out the ore. So that's in place and there's weird erosion that goes on. That's why it caved in several times over the years. And back in, and then in 1985 is when the current owners bought it, uh, Kevin and Randy Rose. And they spent uh, six or seven months right after they purchased it with just a huge influx of cavers coming in and volunteering to help. Bucket brigades taking out tons and tons of, of dirt at the entrance. And uh, they finally, they, they broke through they went in, it was starting to rain, and uh, they went in, they had a look around, and on the way out, uh, Tim, he's a gentleman that lives up there at the property, um, he was he was the main digger, and uh, he was the last one out, and as he stepped out, it collapsed again. So then they brought in structural engineers and whatnot, and uh, basically set up, uh, they did a grid work with rebar and, um, poured a lot of concrete in and, and, and we're able to, to keep this open and it's been open for 35 years now without any, any issue. Uh, there's a culvert, it's a, about a 40 inch culvert um, diameter and it's 40 feet long and it goes at an angle down into the hole. There's a ladder in it and it's, 
uh, a lot of people are, are kind of leery of the ladder, but the thing is, you know, you're, you're in a, you're in a tube, even if you were to, to start to fall, there's, you're really not going to, you're not going to go anywhere. Uh, you, you might catch a leg inside the ladder or something like that and, and injure yourself, but uh, it, it's not like you're just hanging off a, a ladder at 40 feet that's exactly vertical. It's, um, now, if you lean back too far, you you and your pack stick to the uh, inside of the pipe, so <laughs> you, you just hang out for a minute. The uh, the locals down there are, are pretty uh, pretty colorful, and uh, she put in the, the information on there is you know the, most of the caves in North Arkansas there there's the thing of well Jesse James hid hid treasure in it and but apparently uh, when the mining started there was the double J thing at the bottom uh, and they're pretty sure he was there uh, it's on a road called Younger Access and uh, the Younger is are the the descendants of Cole Younger which was part of Jesse James gang and then the Fords and Kellys uh, all these folks that live there their their descendants are still there and they're a lot of them are still kind of outlaws, I guess. So, <laughs> uh, I think uh, meth. Very colorful moved, characters. Yes, and the meth epidemic moved through there and hit those those folks pretty hard. And that's that has since kind of it kind of like white nose. It, it washed through, and and now we're left with. But at least we don't have that to deal with these days. But uh, on the biotica, I, it's. We enjoy the we enjoy the critters, um, cave fish, cave salamanders, cave crickets, or camel crickets, or however you, um, all kinds of little tiny stuff. Uh, most of them are arthropods. We've got springtails, isopods, amphipods that look like little tiny shrimp, and may always live in just one little pool of water for their whole life. Springtails are cool. They don't they don't know where their direction is. They can either be in water or on dry land. So they, uh, they, they've got a little ratcheting system in their tail and they basically ratchet up and it just fires them off <laughs> into the air. And if they yeah, land they in do. water, they, they adapt and they, they live in water. If they land on land and- Apparently they have no control. They just go wherever their spring <laughs> takes them is what we've been told by the biologists. So, um, the background photo Doug took, this is in Ennis, and this is a little tricolor bat. Um, he's got water droplets <laughs> all over him, so he looks kind of crystallized, but he's healthy and alive and had good little happy pink elbows. And <laughs> The uh, tricolors are kind of cool. They're, they're, each hair is, a, or three, there's three different distinct bands of color, and it varies among, uh, you know, the, the population. So this is what we would call a blonde tricolor. Uh, when when it's not covered in water droplets, they're 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 very blonde looking. Uh, there's also some that are almost black. There's some that are more of a, a reddish brown. So it's uh, you can but you can always tell if it's a tricolor because it's about a little bigger than a chicken nugget, and uh, they've got little pink elbows that, that shine out, like she said. Um. Also, as far as the um, the up top portion of the property there. Um, the owners have deemed it a no hunting zone. So um, they own 20 acres there. And then it is surrounded by about 380 acres. The surrounding it does not belong to them. So that those are local folks that there is a lot of hunting on that property. But as far as the Ennis property itself, there's no hunting. So we have deer families there. We have um, a doe that we have watched now for like five years with her different generations of babies come through. We have, um, we did have a really healthy possum population and they've kind of dwindled, but um, we, we've got chipmunks have come and gone. We've had a healthy hawk population there for a few years. They decided to raise their babies on the property, so the mm -hmm. chipmunk population went down. As did the squirrels. Yeah, and squirrels. Um, like we said, we've got, we seem to have a really good uh, red bat population. They're, they're fun to watch. They come out a little earlier in the day than a lot of the other bats, and like the tricolors or the evening bats or any of those. So they'll actually come out when it's still um, late afternoon. So when they, they'll zip around through the valley up there and 
you know, sun will still be out. And so you get glints of the sun hitting them. And for quite some time, we thought we had cardinals or some type of red bird that we kept seeing because when the sun would hit them, they were so bright. And then we finally discovered that we actually had red bats that were, we just didn't realize how early they came out during the day. So they're very active and do lots of crazy acrobats back and forth through the valley and they're, they're fun to watch. Ah. So when it comes down to caving at Ennis or caving in general, um, there are always some basic rules and, and expectations that go along with that. Um, caving anywhere has, you know, proper gear and um, following white nose protocol for cleaning your gear and, and transporting your gear, uh, things like that. Um, as far as Ennis goes though, we do have some things that are specific to that property. Um, you do have to have permission to be on the premises and to go in the cave. So for anyone in the caving community that may contact us that would like to go on a caving trip, um, they have to have permission to be there. Not only is, uh, is the property locked, the cave is gated and locked. Um, so they have to have permission to be there. They have to have permission for a trip in the cave. Um, we, don't, we don't allow folks to go in the cave that have never been in there before if they are not with an experienced trip leader. Um, we just feel like that's the responsible thing to do. Um, you also, um, because of the, the owners require that everyone has to sign a liability waiver for their property. And that includes up top or in the cave. So, and that's the case with most of the privately owned caves um, in Arkansas or, or anywhere, is that most landowners have um, liability waivers that they require that you sign, which makes sense. There's a lot of fear. That's one of the things that um, in the past has tended to keep people from allowing folks to explore caves on private property is they're worried that someone will get hurt or something will happen and they'll be responsible. So it's kind of become common practice for folks to just have a liability waiver that you sign and then you're in better shape or hopefully you get to go. Um, as far as proper gear, and for those of you that have been, you know, um, helmet, lights, 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 <laughs> three sources of lights, um, gloves, um, common misperception, uh, a lot of folks say, think that when we tell them you need gloves and we talk about the temperature of the cave is 58 degrees year round, they tend to think that gloves are to protect them and keep their hands warm. And we will let them know quickly that I'm not concerned about your cold hands, that um, the gloves are strictly there to protect the cave, that, you know, the oils on your, on your hands, if you touch something, you know, they can stop the growth of the formation. Um, just that little bit of oil off of your hand can do that. So wearing the gloves is a must. Um, having appropriate footwear, that's, that's good for the cave and good for you. You don't, you don't want to struggle. And we have learned the hard way that not having the proper footwear can make your trip twice as hard. So you will struggle more if you're slipping and sliding in the mud with something that doesn't have as good a grip, you know. Um, knee pads knee pads and um, and then just having a small pack and your water and your extra batteries and you know some emergency supplies with you. Um, when you go caving you always let someone that is not going in the cave know that when you're going in and when you expect to be out and the polite and proper thing to do is to let them know when you do come out. That way if you don't come out on time um, they will know, and you let someone know that knows who to contact. Um, there are a group of cave um, rescue folks in the state of Arkansas now that has just come together in the last couple of years. Um, but also, and folks in the caving community know that if you say, I'm gonna be out of the cave at six o'clock, that they don't start worrying until eight o'clock. Because when you go in the cave, you, it's easy to lose track of time. You can get stuck looking at formations or whatever and just not make it out when you thought you were going to. So, so even with, with notifying someone, no one's getting in a panic and, and, and calling in rescue folks for you for a few hours past your time just because we all know how that goes. Um, 
what one of the things that we promote heavily when we're taking new folks caving um, is to help each other out. Lend a hand, lend a foot, whatever you need. Sometimes when you're climbing something, um, it comes back to different body types and things as well. That whereas Doug is six foot four and I'm five foot seven, the difference in our height and leg length can be the difference in he can just climb right up something with ease where I may struggle on my own for 20 minutes, just surely for the fact that I don't have the span to, uh, to make it across something. But at the same time, my femurs are great and long and uh, to negotiate a tight spot, uh, she will do better than I will and, and, and to get through. So for all the different features there are in caves, there's something for everyone. And there's, there's something that everyone will, will do better than someone else at. So it, it's, it's kind of neat as, as you go and you figure this out. Yeah, we've had plenty of folks tell us, you know, say, oh, well, I'm worried, you know, I have really short legs, or are we gonna, you know, or I'm, I'm taller, or I'm bigger, or I'm whatever. And it's like, just wait, because there will be your spot in the cave where that, you're, it's your perfect place. And, and people, I think, tend to gravitate towards those things where it's, oh, this fits me perfect. That tends to be the kind of place you enjoy the most. Um, one of the other things that we really try to preach to new caving folks is don't try something underground that you can't do above ground. So if you can't climb, if you don't climb outside, then don't try to climb a big place underground. Um, it's still, it, gravity works the same, <laughs> you know, it doesn't change underground. Just a lot harder to get you back up. Yeah. <laughs> so. So that's just something we try to really make people stop and think about because it is a different environment and something about the dark and the cool and you don't tend to you know get hot and sweaty as quick as you would up top you, you know there's just something it make it gives you some false confidence sometimes <laughs> and so and we have all put ourselves in that position and and we know <laughs> i'm a actually i'm a retired paramedic and um, i've also been through the um ACRC um, uh, cave rescue stuff and, and whatnot. Okay. And so it's, um, I just don't want to use that stuff. I mean, it's, that's why I'm retired, <laughs> but, but it's good to have the knowledge. We do have a lot of rescue gear up there. Uh, we, we've outfitted it really well with, 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 we've got stretchers. We've got, I mean, we've got the whole nine yards up there that we basically provided ourselves. And, and we also have are in close contact with um, other cave rescue folks so so there's a good number of those people that are certified there are different ones that have been through varying levels of certifications in the state and like I said that's just come into play in the last couple of years prior to that there were no cave rescue folks in the state of Arkansas a state that has over 2,000 caves and we didn't have actual people that were certified and knew the right ways to package somebody up if you were two miles back in a cave with a broken leg you know how to get you out of there safely and and so now we have those folks and um, it's a good network of people and they are easily easy for us to reach so so that's something we're very happy that has come together uh, pretty recent and um, some other things that uh, we really, and some of the other caving community um, don't always follow the same kind of guidelines that we set, but we really harp on stay with the group. There's nothing like turning around and the 17 year old kid that you've brought into the group and now, and you've got 10 people in there and you can't find him. Even though he may be an experienced caver as well, you can't find him. And the, the panic that sets in, the anxiety that comes with backtracking and trying to locate that kid. So we are just really, really stay, stay with the group. And especially if you are someone, if you've not been there before, if you don't know your way around, don't, don't pay attention and don't get stuck looking at uh, you know, a formation on the wall while the rest goes, <laughs> keeps so moving. We always try to have one trip leader at the beginning and one at the end. That way we can kind of keep things, you know, in between. Yeah, we and try to have experienced people who are, someone is um, leading the group and then what we call somebody's running tail, which means you're bringing up the tail end of the group. And so between the two of you, 
And depending on the number of people, if we have a larger group, then we will make sure that we have more experienced people in there. But we also put the responsibility on those people to make sure you know how many people you have with you, that you stop and count heads ever so often. You know, and when we take some of the college groups and some younger folks in, wow. we absolutely do a head count. We number everybody off and we, you know, ever so often stop and make them, you know, count off. And we will go so far as to also say, you know, we're gonna put in the buddy system. So if you have one person that you're responsible for knowing where they are. And if you don't know where they are, you alert somebody and, you know, we go from there. But we haven't had any, any problems. People tend to, um, experienced cavers sometimes get a little put out with with our ideas of how we should do that but as far but we really enjoy taking new folks caving and getting them um to have that experience and hopefully want to go back again and some other things that we do are don't touch stuff just don't touch stuff <laughs> every bit there is nothing more tempting than a soda straw with a drop of water on the end of it that's right at eye level and you want to touch that fingertip to that thing so bad that you can't hardly stand it and I don't know what that is but that fingertip touching that could be the thing that makes that stop growing so we just tell people just don't touch stuff put your hands know. behind your back and lean up and look at it and it's, yep. it's just take fine. a picture or whatever but just don't touch it um it, that seems contrary to the next thing, which is main three, maintaining three points of contact. But maintaining three points of contact is while you're moving, when you are, you know, when you're climbing, when you're sliding down something, whatever, you know, use your hands, use your feet, use your butt, use your elbow, use your knees, whatever, but just make sure that you've got three points making contact with the ground to give, give you stability. And there's nothing like the false confidence of going, going over something and then realizing halfway through crossing something that now you're off balance and, you know, a lot of folks don't want to sit on their butt and slide and we tell them that's another point of contact and you're, you're going to be really stable if you're that low to the ground. <laughs> in, a, in a bad spot, we've actually used an elbow, a, a heel and a forehead. Yes. <laughs> To, to get through stuff. So that's three points and you're always more stable with three points than you are standing up on two. And learning to, to be going back to helping each other when, when you are maintaining those three points. And sometimes there, if you've got to go up a mud slide that is just slick, it can be extremely difficult. And so if the person behind you can, can plant their heel into the side of that slide and you use your, their foot as a step, or you know something like that we strongly encourage that because there's no point in struggling and wearing yourself out when you're there to enjoy it so um one of the other things in a cave is like most hiking and anything else is pack it in pack it out so whatever goes in with you has to come back out with you we spent about two years uh doing cave cleanup in there and uh, right now it's probably as pristine as it's as it's yeah. ever been we've gotten the graffiti most the majority of graffiti that we, and a lot of that stuff was from years ago from surveying um and just little bits of trash, little pieces of flagging, little caps it's to very water easy. bottles. And when it's, you're sitting there in the dark and you've stopped to take a break to eat a snack, you know, it's very easy to drop that little piece of wrapper off of your granola bar or something and not even realize you did it. So we try to encourage folks to take a look around before you get up and take off again and um, just be very careful. We'll eventually find it and pick it up. Yeah. <laughs> Um, the other thing is following proper white nose syndrome protocol for your gear. Um, so what gear, right now that we know that white nose can stay on your gear and stay live for 48 to 72 hours. So that means if you come out of the cave and you throw your gear in the trunk of your car and leave it there for two or three days, it can stay live and active there. And for cavers and folks that go from one cave to another, if you're visiting multiple caves, and it, that's not uncommon for people to have a caving weekend where they might go to different caves. So you have to be mindful of those. You can't wear that gear into a cave that you know has had white nose in it and then turn around and the next day pull that gear out and put it back on to go in a different cave. We just pretend like all caves have white nose. Right. It's, we figure that's just the safest way to be. 
um, you can use their, you know, like 409 and there's some products out there with bleach and all that. The downside of all that is it kills your caving gear. You know, <laughs> the threads on your boots are going, your knee pads are going to come apart. Everything's going to be ruined. So with some of the biologists and the folks working on um, the research, they've also figured out that really hot water, like boiling water. So now it's kind of when you come out of the cave and you take your gear off, you know, you step it off into a big garbage bag, you seal it up good and it doesn't get opened until you're back to where you can properly clean it. And then um, boiling water and hot water and a big wash tub and tossing everything in from your boots to, you know, your bandana and getting and letting it soak in the hot water. And that has become part of the, the newer protocol that's acceptable and, and shows a way to maintain your gear because sometimes your gear is not cheap. Um, and still actually fight the disease and not take a chance on spreading it. Um, some ways that Ennis Cave is kind of unique. Most caves offer more or less one type of terrain. So there are caves that are referred to as wet caves or dry caves. Um, you know, you might have a cave that has um, a stream bed all the way through it. Um, um, a wet stream bed all the way through the whole cave. We've, we've done one that was a little over two miles of uh, chest deep water yeah. to, to get into the, the, the dry part of the caves. So. Yeah, so most of them have a primary feature like that wet, dry, or maybe they have, um, maybe it's primarily crawling passages, or maybe it's primarily um, climbing, or you know, Super whatever vertical. their primary, primary type of, yeah, vertical pits, whatever. Um, but Ennis is different in that it offers a long, that you have a good amount of walking passage where you can just walk other than, you know, it's rocky. It's not like walking on a sidewalk, but you can still stay upright and walk without having to crawl and not having to climb. And you can do an entire caving trip that way. And we've got pretty clearly delineated paths through there because if people stay on the same path, then they don't wind up spreading mud all over and everything doing damage else. to other places so um but it also in this you can go in and you can do a trip where you walk as much as you want you can also do as much crawling as you want into different areas um i mean there there are some really cool areas in the cave where you have to crawl whether it be belly crawling or knee crawling um for quite some distance um, there's also a, a hundred foot waterfall in the cave. So to get there, you have to traverse some wet passage, some sumps that you have to get in. Um, on a good day, it's just thigh high water, but you're also leaned over to get through that. On a bad day, it's... it's we call it an ear dip. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to get wet and cold. There's the top and there's your ear and yeah. there's the water. So, so and there are places where, you know, tight squeezes, there are big giant, um, what, what cavers call a big giant borehole passage. So they're giant and huge. So you don't even have to duck or no. lean over. You just I mean, walk. you know, they can be 30 feet high and, you know, 20 feet wide and you're just walking through. So it's very unique in that you can actually choose the kind of trip you do. So for the folks that are less inclined to want to crawl or maybe they are claustrophobic and they are not willing to go try out a crawl or a tight squeeze, they can just wander around in these big open passages and, and do what they, you know, pick what they enjoy about it. Tons of fossils down there too. There's a fossil layer that runs all the way through the cave that, that, that you can just stand and look at forever. It's uh, find all kinds of little, little features in that. As far as traversing the cave though, the only, the only exception to choosing what kind of trip you like to do is the ladder because the 40 foot ladder in is also the 40 foot ladder out. So the only way in and out of there is going up and down that ladder. So that's where you don't get a choice. <laughs> And that's a picture of our daughter. And if you look at the hole, um, well, yeah, there, there is a hole that we found one New Year's Eve. Uh, it was starting to flood a little bit. And uh, there's a, a spot in the dry stream passage within Ennis that uh, we, we saw a, a lot of water, you know, coming down through the stream passage. And we went around uh, some, some things and back to the stream passage and it was dry on the other side. 
So we backtracked again and went down another little piece of passage that most people never go down. And the water was coming out like a, a geyser um, out from under some rocks. And the, the picture of our daughter, that, that little hole she's climbing out of is where the water was blowing out of. This, this spot where I'm sitting in the picture that's up now, Sorry, I was trying to show the one up here again. I'm sorry. Yeah, so that's that's the uh, that's the picture of, of her coming out of the the hole. It's it's it was tight. Uh, now we've opened it up a little more, and what what we found is after that dried out and the water went back down, we went back up there, and we discovered a new area. It's uh, it's probably a, about 40 feet wide uh, from top to bottom. It's about 35 feet deep from from where you enter to to the bottom where I went down into a little gravel pit and dug that out and actually got up uh, got my head into a, a stream passage that nobody knew was there so it, it was very exciting yeah a whole um, new level of the cave that we didn't know was was there so yeah. so this is me gearing up uh, to actually go down to descend, that. to descend into that and find out what's down there and that, and that was that was exciting. Um, so our our last little thing there is um, Cavers Rescue Spelunkers. So <laughs> that is um, kind of our little joke in the caving community. I'm trying to get back to stopping this year. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. um, well, you know, we were talking about misunderstood with bats and Emily did a great job of, of, of explaining the, the misunderstood and it's kind of the same with caves. So a lot of people will view caves or, or pits or holes in the ground as problematic. Um, farmers uh, back in the old days they would uh, and even now they will uh, they'll fill in if they find a pit or a sinkhole or something like that uh, You know they could lose livestock in it. There's some up on Gaither Mountain outside of Harrison that uh, they lost numerous livestock horses cows everything in and, and so there's this story that they they let 200 feet of giant logging chain down in there with a piece of meat on it and it chewed the end off of it so there's monsters down there. <laughs> so it but it keeps people out of it, which, which is good for conservation. But Most of them will fill them in, use them like a dump. They'll lose, use it like a dump, and we found that on on numerous ones. Most of them farther down on the Ozark Plateau, just before you get to say Van Buren County. Um, there's there's some areas there where there are a lot of fingers of uh, limestone coming out. So with that, there's also a lot of little pits around there, and they tend to want to fill those in. Uh, with, with trash, junk, whatever, they make a good dump pile. And we've actually gone miles back into a, a slot cave that went uh, way back into uh, the side of the mountain. And we, we'd find pieces of screen and pieces of old stuff that had washed down. So we know on the other end of that, that there's, there's a dump pit. There's a, a the cleanup guy, uh, the expert, John Beard out of Missouri, um, they 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 have gone to places where they had heard stories about a cave being there and actually excavated tons and tons and tons of junk and old cars and tires and yeah, wheels and everything else out and, and, and found these beautiful caves that were just completely blocked off. So that that's that's part of the the misconception part there. And uh, you know they they fill them in. It's uh, disappeared. Yeah, they just disappear. Oh, I disappeared. <laughs> I disappear too. Yeah, the caves disappear when you fill them in. I disappear when I lean over. But, all right. Well, thank yeah. you all. That was a great presentation. I appreciate it. Well, we look, we really, we would love to have you guys up there yeah, right now. I mean, we, we're kind of itching for that ourselves. So it's, uh, part of the reason we, the cave is closed right now, and we decided on that Memorial Day weekend, we always have a huge get together. And this was the 35th anniversary. It was supposed to be a big one and uh, we canceled it because we don't know uh, for one thing close quarters without a lot of air movement and a large group of people i'm, I'm not up for that um the you know the other thing is we don't know we don't know how long this stuff lives on the surface the, the covid stuff uh, and it you know if, if if you've got really good uh conditions down there for for a virus uh you know it's not hot it 
it's it's cool, it's wet, it's damp. It's so we don't we don't know, and we don't we don't want to infect anything else. We don't want a sick cave. We don't want Tim to get sick or we, the guy sick that lives people, up there. Sick so it's uh, and, and until until things settle down a little bit. But I, I I promise you, you guys will be the first ones we <laughs> we let know when this comes back up because we we're itching to get underground, y'all. Yeah. So okay. it's. Uh, okay. Questions. Second, Tammy, let me ask you, the guy who we saw working in clearing the uh, the cave out, correct? Yes. Right, yeah. He likes to move gravel. <laughs> I know. <laughs> How, how's he doing? I was kind of worried about him since you guys kind of closed down the cave. That was kind of his livelihood. Uh, he likes it. <laughs> he, um, he is the only one going in the cave right now. No one has been in but him, so he's continuing his work but he is the only person going in so for months now he's been it no one else and we've been the only visitors to the property so we go in and check on him every few weeks and um, you know stay our distance away but we can we can sit in our chairs out there outside and visit and catch up and make sure he's doing okay see if he needs anything but but he's kind of He's such a loner anyway that he's a professional his life hasn't distancer. changed. Yeah, he's, <laughs> his life hasn't changed nearly as much as the rest of us. So he's not too sad. I was going to tell Emily that um, when you get in there, they actually put in some uh, chandeliers, yeah. and some lights, and so on, and they've had several weddings there. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So there's a, a particular room in the cave called the Rose Rotunda, the Rose family being the, one, the owners. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a a large round dish room. Multiple passages coming yeah, off. that come off of it. And Tim, he was the he was the manager and the steward of the cave for years and he has kind of retired only to doing his work in the cave now. So he got this idea of um, building a chandelier out of old wagon wheels and had it built and then we yeah we we and so there it is. <laughs> It's an area of the cave that, um, it's a dry area of the cave, so it's called the maze. Um, mm -hmm. It's one of the upper levels of the cave, so it's dry. There's no moisture. There's really, that that area, there's not much in the way of um, bats or, or any critters or anything. Yeah. And it's mostly dirt, <laughs> dirt room, so. A lot of gravel. Yeah, It's, it's a gravel. gravel fill right there, so, so he moves the gravel. Uh, we, we, we have mixed uh, feelings about it. Uh, but it's gravel and he's just moving it from one place to another and so we can reconcile with that but it's uh it, it, he's a force of nature if we told him to stop he would only dig more so it's, uh, it's, that's a funny it's a idea giant chandelier that has 70 something candles on it that um, wow. is on a uh, cable on a chain and a cable and a pulley and that you have to lower to the ground and light all the candles and then you can raise it and we always kind of <laughs> grumble about it and all that until it's actually lit and then when it's raised and lit we're like oh man it is really cool it looks really cool and, <laughs> but that's the only place in there where there's been manipulation to the like point of, of other stuff being brought in um, mm -hmm. everything else is, stays wild so it's uh but yeah, then you walk around the corner and it's like, when, I think when our group went in, uh, go around the corner and there's this old guy in there and he's, he's digging away and he's, he looks back and he goes, well, hello, and just keeps digging. <laughs> it's like, what the hell is this? <laughs> there's just a man in the cave. Yeah. It's a more life, but. But he lives there on the property, right? Right. He does. He's, yeah. he's lived there now for. 20? So right around 20 years <laughs> that um, when he retired from his job in Missouri, he had been coming to the cave since they, uh, well, before they bought the cave, he had been coming to the property. But when the Rose family, they, he was friends with them in Missouri. And when they bought the cave, um, he was he was coming down as often as he could to go, go cave in there. And when he retired from his job at 55 or so, um, he basically got a divorce <laughs> and packed his stuff and moved to the moved to the property there's there's no electricity um there is a well on the property but there's no electricity to power a pump so, so we have a generator and a reservoir so you can pump water into the reservoir run the generator for a bit and then everything's gravity fed like to his cabin it's gravity fed water there and then they're just composting outhouses and so 
he lives a very basic life in his cabin but but you'll be 73 this year so. yeah. yeah so yeah. and he's built like a well, you know he's <laughs> he, he, he get out hike out out whatever you know, <laughs> there's no doubt <laughs> and stay clean the entire time somehow. yes anyway. <laughs> all right any other questions for them or for Julie? for the members of the group who have not been in it um it is just a wonderful time you don't have to be crawling on your knees or your back or so on it's a beautiful hike in, although it is kind of a, uh, uh, it's exercise. You you go about a mile in there and you are sweating. You are sweating a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's kind of deceiving in that way. You think, you know, you're just walking along and then you're like, whew, well, man. <laughs> Sometimes the next day you find out you've got muscles you didn't know you had. I, I found out where my piriformis was. It was great. <laughs> All right, well, see. I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, has the guy, has he found some new passages and uh, what would, I mean, does anybody, if he should get hurt or should something happen to him, is there anybody that knows that he's in there? I mean, is there any safety we, measures for him? We know. We have kind of a working thing <laughs> of, you know, we, and we talked about it. There, there, there will come a day when we come up and he's, most likely that we will be the ones that find him expired. <laughs> yes, and and it's you know we we talked about it and he's very practical about it, but uh, yeah, really no. <laughs> There's a uh, it's completely isolated. The, the you know the 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 road gate stays locked. Uh, nobody else no. really knows what's going on up there. That you, previously we we were up there every single weekend, and we would be up there. A lot of times Friday evening, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, so we were up there a lot, and we checked back in during the week. As things kind of we we finished the cleanup, we got a lot of other things that we wanted to do straightened out. We we concentrated more on bats and and whatnot. So now we're especially with the the isolation stuff. We've only been going up maybe once, maybe twice a month. Um, but we so, do know his routine, so we know what days. He's not in the cave every single day. So we do know his routine. We know what days he does. And he is very routine oriented. So we know what day he is in the cave working. We know what day he's working out, <laughs> you know, what he's doing on the property. So we do at least know. So if something were to happen, if we showed up and he wasn't at his cabin or wasn't present, we would, we would at least have an idea of, where he would be or and how long he had been there. Really quick, there was a day that we went up there and it, it had just snowed um, the, the night before. We got up there and uh, messed around for a little while and uh, I looked down and I said, well, the cave gate's open, so I guess Tim's still in the cave. And it was right about dark and Tim's always out well before dark. He's, he says he's afraid of the dark, but he works in the cave all day. But the uh, I, there was one set of footprints in the snow going in, and that was it. So I started gearing up to go in and made it all the way down to the pipe, and I could hear him. And uh, he had had a collapse in there, and uh, a, a whole bank had fallen off and basically pinned him. And he used a knife and a uh, putty knife, putty knife and, a, and his pocket knife, I think, to, to get himself out of it. But it, it hit his wheelbarrow, flipped his wheelbarrow over, broke the handles on it, crushed the wheelbarrow, but he was between the handles, so it didn't, but yeah. So it pinned him like from his, it has his legs completely pinned. Now, that was not in a regular area of the cave. That was in his dig, a spot which, where he had made the changes to the dirt. And where we so. had warned him several times <laughs> that there's a large bank up there with a big crack, and the, the last three times it's grown, so watch out. and. Anyway, but so so that that happened. But luckily, you know, we knew at that time we knew what day of the week he was digging. We showed up and knew that if he wasn't out yet, oh, he'll be out soon. And then he wasn't out soon. So yeah. heading in to go check on him, and then there he came. <laughs> so. But he's as interesting as, as as the cave is just yeah. about <laughs> if you if you get him off to the side and talk to him. So. Yeah. I want to ask about bats and honeybees. Mm -hmm. Do they get along? peaceably or are they in competition with each other? Um, as far as I know, they don't, 
I think because they're probably out and moving primarily at different times and I've never never heard or seen anything about there any issues with them. In other words, if you were to put up a bad house at, at your house and also raise bees, mm -hmm. they would coexist without right. one fighting the other or one would be first shift, the other would be second <laughs> right. shift. There you go. Yeah. Shift Thank you. Shift. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Taking care of things and yeah. Wasps would be your main problem with a bat house. They really like to build their nests in those around here. <laughs> Arkansas wasps would like the bat houses. I don't know if they do in other places. But <laughs> uh, I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah, they just like anything. They like to put their house anywhere. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Emily. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Emily. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. I learned a lot from your presentation. Oh, we learned a lot from yeah. you. So but come, come, go cave in with us sometime. Right? Yeah, I'd love to. <laughs> Stay I'll, in I'll send out uh, an email to you with the location of the recording and uh, a, a, a small handout that has some reference material or how to go to reference materials for uh, bats and, and some for caving. So. Thank We've also got some books and some resources that we were just talking about that we can send those to you and let you share with some things that we found that we think would be really good for folks to yeah, interested. Cool. All right. Well, one, one quick one.